Should you shut the fuck up before you get us both killed? Stalin's dead. He's dead. Stalin is dead! Oh, my God. Our general secretary is lying in a puddle of indignity. Yeah, he's feeling unwell, clearly. I want to make a speech at my father's funeral. Um, no problem. Technically, yes, but practically. When I said no problem, what I meant was no problem. Ignore me. I have no idea what is going on. I'm the peacemaker, and I'll fuck up anyone who gets in my way. Come on! Play better, you flattering fannies! Get it! Give it! Hit it! Shoot her before him, but make sure he sees it. Kill him, dump him in the pulpit. And I'll leave the rest up to you. We have to act. I really need your help. I'm going to have to report this conversation. Threatening to do harm or obstruct any member of the Presidium in the process of looking at your fucking face. <laughs> I took Germany. I think I can take a flesh lump in a waistcoat. No matter what happens, I will never let any harm come to you. I may as well just shoot myself like mother. Jesus Christ, did Coco Chanel take a shit on your head? No, he did not. Stalin will be loving this. I'll take it from here. Good luck, ladies. You know, all of you can kiss my Russian ass. Don't worry, nobody's gonna get killed, I promise you. Greetings, dear listeners, and very welcome to our newest episode of Fans About Films. I am creator and host Lasse Vogt, and as always, I have a wonderful guest for you. Today's candidate is a gentleman who contributed music for several well-known films and television series. His newest project is for British comedy The Death of Stalin. I am very happy to have him on this show, Mr. Christopher Willis. Hi, Lasse. Great to be here. Awesome. So, um, tell us a little bit about yourself. What are you doing exactly? Uh, well, I just got back from Sundance, uh, where the uh, US premiere of uh, The Death of Stalin was happening. Um, uh, that's been very exciting. Uh, though, of course, I have my uh, I have regular TV shows that I'm doing all the time, and so uh, there was very little time to feel uh, starry and to swan about. I actually um, was right in the middle of an episode of The Lion Guard, Uh, my Disney Junior show while I was up there. So uh, I was just up there very briefly and then came straight back and had to uh, get back into it. Um, writing the, the, the music to animated TV shows is very, very labor intensive. Uh, so, um, yeah, my, my nose is to the grindstone a lot of the time. I, I can imagine. It, it sounds very time consuming uh, and, and very difficult, but. Um... Yeah, I, um, I think when uh, when it works out, uh, that's a great feeling. I can imagine. Yeah, that's right. It's nice in some ways to have these these large canvases of, of uh, uh, on which to write music. Um, and the Line Guard is a show that has actually no temp track, so every single time, every two weeks or so, I get a, a new episode and have to have to fill it. And in some ways, I increasingly just think of the whole episode as one very long. Uh, cue and just just uh, just write um, you know as as quickly as practically possible uh, and it's it's interesting in some ways just to just to have the practice of doing that uh, over and over rather than uh, angsting and stopping and second guessing and, and going over and over which is which is what happens on a on a movie a lot of the time uh, on that show you're hearing you're hearing version one basically. <laughs> That's great. No tam track. That's that's pretty rare nowadays. I have to say. Uh, yes, it's extraordinary. Actually, uh, it really. It, it, if you've been used to having a temp track all the time, and then suddenly that's the new reality. It makes you realize how much uh, 
you relied on it, but it also, I think, frees you up to, to well, once you get used to the strangeness of it, you know, that there's, there's no limit to how, how, how huge a moment could be or to the composer's freedom to shape, to shape the, the, the action. You know, where, where, are the, where are the mountaintops in the episode and how, how high are they uh, and where are the valleys? So yeah. it's been it's been an extraordinary education actually that show uh, very valuable. Oh yeah, um, so um, let's get um, in into some details here. Um, uh, I, I think uh, a lot of the listeners um, uh, are interested in how exactly um, did your um, career start? Uh, well, I had a very much a classical music upbringing. I would say I was, I was a, a pianist. Uh, um, all the way through my teens, and I always loved films. I was I was besotted with with films, but actually, film music, film music itself, wasn't particularly on my radar when I was uh, when I was a young person. Um, uh, it was just sort of part of the film experience to me, um, and so I, I became. I became a concert pianist in my early twenties and was and was just sort of starting out on that on that road, you know, traveling around doing concertos. Uh, I was finding it rather repetitive, <laughs> and I wasn't at right at the at the at the, the top of that game. I would say I was I was um, sort of somewhere <laughs> somewhere on that ladder. Uh, I went back to university. Um, And did a PhD. I, I had been at Cambridge uh, for my undergrad, and I went back again uh, to do a, a PhD. Um, so still in classical music, but but just sort of moving from one thing to another. Oh, no, I should say all this time I'd been composing, but I just didn't quite know what I was going to do with it. So I was I was a uh, I was a, a classical music nomad, I guess. Um, and then then I, I finished my PhD. And um, just towards the end of that, I suddenly sort of had this this realization that that film music had been waiting <laughs> all my life as this thing that would that would that would marry all of my interests together. Um, um, I, was, I was also very attracted, actually, to the I, I had been writing concert music, but I was I was frustrated at uh, how slowly I wrote concert music and how uh, strange that that landscape was. Uh, it's it's actually less strange now, but 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 it was so um, dogmatically atonal in in the 90s when I was sort of trying to work out who I was, and the idea of of, of coming to a place where um, stylistically where where you had a huge audience that, that that wants the music and wants the music to to to, to be emotional and to be clear, and where you were going to be asked to write lots of it, so you were going to develop a good technique. Was very attractive. So, so um, for lots of reasons, I quite suddenly um, got really interested in film music, and uh, was lucky enough to get in touch with um, uh, Rupert Gregson Williams, um, and became his assistant. And so I came very quickly. Try, was went from Cambridge to LA uh, to work for Rupert, uh, and that was at um, Remote Control Productions, um, Hans Zimmer's place. And so from from Rupert, I then worked with, with various other people. And so quite quickly, I uh, suddenly was uh, was not worrying about academia <laughs> or, 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 uh, or, or, or my piano playing so much and was suddenly writing music all the time and uh, helping out on, on, uh, on, on mainstream scores. Oh, man, that sounds fascinating. Um, I, I should say I was I was wildly underqualified in some ways. Um, uh, I had not realized how specialized film music really is uh, and how different it is in, in many ways from, from every other kind of music. I was a good musician, and I think Rupert, Rupert was, was, was interested, you know, sort of saw some, some promise in, in uh, the things that I showed him. But, but uh, I really didn't know much about, about filmmaking, and I really knew very little about writing to picture um, And Rupert was an extraordinary mentor and extraordinarily patient in, uh, in letting me see the way that he worked and, um, and, and answering questions I had about it. Oh, yeah. 
Um, uh, well, you uh, you pretty much started out as an uh, additional composer on a lot of scores. You um, you have uh, credits on uh, movies like you know, and bedtime stories, um, uh, Shrek Forever After, um, uh, uh, Henry Jackman's Winnie Pooh, and um, uh, X Men First Class. You know, a lot of uh, films uh, by. Uh, by composers like you know Harry Gregson Williams, Rupert Gregson Williams, and Henry Jackman, and um, I was always very curious about the working process of an additional composer. What exactly uh, uh, does an additional composer do? I think most of us have a, a, a slight understanding of uh, that profession, but I'm very interested in uh, in the working process. Right. Well, it. Um... Uh, the tricky thing is that it can mean lots of things. It uh, is a very wide range of, of what what that might entail. Um, well, it, well, there's one thing it definitely doesn't principally mean, and it's the thing that I thought it meant when I first heard that phrase. It sounds uh, in some ways like it means um, that uh, there might be incidental music, you know, coming out of a, a radio in the film or or hold music on a, and a, when someone in the film is on a phone call or something um, it may it may mean it may mean that it may mean that, that that one of the composer's assistants has 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 been given the job of writing that that stuff um, but it doesn't principally mean that um, it basically can run can run the gamut from um, really uh, really very menial tasks logistical tasks um, of which there are many in film uh, that that the composer has has decided to to uh, to to give the, to give their assistant this additional music credit for, um, and it can run the gamut all the way from there to uh, to ghostwriting, to to a person writing large amounts of um, uh, of of someone else's score. I've 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 heard stories about about large amounts of music being being written, but there is a there is a way that it can be done that's good, I think. Uh, on, a, on a modern score, particularly a big mainstream score, you've got orchestra, you've got choir, you've got electronics, you've got audio elements that may have been recorded for one cue but would be suitable for another cue. There are ways in which the lead composer can, um, can be fully in command artistic, artistically of what's going on. But physically not able to uh, to carry out the the fine grain of every single job, just as the main composer isn't playing the trombone or playing the viola uh, <laughs> in the orchestra. There may be ways in which you can say, "Well, this cue, uh, this cue I've sketched out roughly. Um, uh, it should sound roughly. You know, it should. The texture should be the same as this cue from real one. Now, now we're in real three, and I need I need help to." Uh, to transfer over all the elements, um, it may it may additional music composers may get heavily involved in picture cuts, where the the, the picture keeps changing length and the music keeps becoming um, uh, you know wrong. You know somehow you need to take a phrase that's 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 eight seconds long and work out how to make it ten seconds long. Um, uh, but as I say, it's it's uh, it's. It's open to abuse for sure. It can be. It's it's a very good way for a person to start in uh, in Hollywood in music. But it, uh, it if a, if a person is not well known, but developing more and more skills, then then they can be exposed to this problematic situation where composers take more music than they, more films than they can actually score, and and they they basically employ other people to do things that. That really, by rights, or you know, deserve a, a big screen credit. Um, so it's a, it, I think it's an age-old situation in in Hollywood music, uh, and it's always been this very uh, this very varied shades of grey kind of thing. I must say, my my experiences were, were generally very good. I think I, I think I stopped doing it at around the time that I. Uh, that I would have liked to. I, I arrived in LA so um, uninformed about about film music that it was enormously valuable to to be mentored by by people that, that really knew what they were doing. Oh yeah, uh, because I think a lot of people are under the impression that the concept of uh, additional composers was kind of invented by uh, Hans Zimmer and uh, Remote Control because you um, 
you you see the you see additional composers on 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 remote control uh, com composed albums like all the time but yeah it's 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 actually uh, something that's uh, that's been around for for a long time uh, as you said so yeah that's uh, uh, you pretty much described what i figured it would be but but it but it's great to actually hear from something who has a lot of experience uh, to to confirm my thoughts on it there's an interesting process i think whereby at first it's it's both very difficult and very thrilling to get into the mindset of uh, uh, of another composer i think it's good to to get away from that world eventually because it, it gets it gets mentally rather confusing it's good to to retain one's own identity and not simply you know, you find that, that three or four years down the line, one simply turned into a clone of the person one was working for. Um, so I think it's, uh, yeah, there, there, there are good and bad, good and bad things to it. I agree with you about um, about Hans. I think in some ways he's 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 borne the brunt of people's awareness of this of this concept, uh, where in fact he he, he was. He was just relatively open about it, and of course, he was in the, on the vanguard of, of scores that were so enormously wide in terms of the number of tracks they had. You know, these, these huge orchestral choral things. But I think if you if you dig back into the into the uh, the history of the studios, uh, and you and you sort of um, look at well, who was the head of music, and, and who were all these other people? Uh, were they all just orchestrating? That seems a bit strange. Um, <laughs> Presumably, the sort of group effort led by one person actually goes back into the into the earlier days of the studio system. Although I don't know much about that, it, it, you you may you may actually know more about that than I do. Oh yeah, but but you but you're pretty much right. Yeah, that's uh, that's how it was on on those big old uh, movies back then when actually composing for film was was something a lot of people. Uh, look look down upon you know like um, they 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 said uh, one one uh, I think one critic said no musician who actually has some dignity wrote right for film um, <laughs> for uh, for any other reason than money and you see where it is now and how it how it evolved and how much uh, this type of music uh, is is liked all over the world so. Um, yeah, you you can confirm that quote. I mean, it's it's his opinion. I it was his opinion, I guess. But but you confirm that quote wrong because you have a, such uh, an amount of uh, amazing composers uh, working uh, in in that field today. Right, right. Uh, well, so, certainly, um, it uh, it was wonderful to to in the end to to uh, um, to land movie gigs and 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 TV gigs and to be. To, and to already have seen the inside of the industry, you know, to, to have observed other composers working, and to and to to be relatively confident of uh, being able to overcome everyday hurdles without just coming in coming in completely um, completely blind, you know, straight out of straight out of film school. Oh yeah, <laughs> um, when uh, when you are scoring a project, uh, do you have a certain uh, inspiration in your head? Like, uh, do you have certain composers you uh, you are looking up to uh, in terms of you know style and legacy. I sp I've always spent a lot of time listening to and, and thinking about classical music. Um, that goes back really to to uh, to my time in academia. Uh, so very often I'm that's kind of at the back of my mind. Uh, you know if you if you ever you know look at a bit of uh, the Marriage of Figaro or. or uh, go to Demeron and think of it as though it were a film score cue. <laughs> oh yeah, you definitely come away thinking, "Well, that was a good cue," you know, <laughs> <laughs> good job, Mozart. Um, so that's that's sort of sort of knocking around in my mind, and I think it sort of keeps you humble as well, you know, because it uh, would be very difficult to, uh, to 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 ever do anything that had that kind of grace and and uh, and perfection to it. Um, my day-to-day -day life these days, I I, uh, I do these uh, Mickey Mouse cartoons, uh, the Mickey Mouse shorts on the Disney Channel, and they take place all over the world. And so my, uh, at the moment, I'm generally getting inspiration from all of the little bits of research that I'm doing for those. Uh, um, some of them are some of them are set in a sort of anywheresville, USA. Yeah. And, a kind of a cabaret or or, or mid-century 60s 
uh, kitschy kind of sound. But a lot of them take place in, in far-flung places. And I have to very suddenly spend a month thinking about uh, uh, the music of, of the country where, where the episode is set. So uh, I was listening to lots of samba um, in, the, uh, in November, December um, uh, for an episode uh, in Brazil and uh, listening to, to Chinese music also recently for an episode set in China. The lessons that I learned from those things tend to stay with me and weirdly sort of filter over into other things. I mean, the, the amount that I've learned about uh, percussion from, say, doing a Brazilian Mickey Mouse or, uh, or an Indian Mickey Mouse, that then I'm, is still vaguely in my mind when I'm doing drums in something more, more generic, more, more, more cinematic, uh, uh, is extraordinary. Um, just to think about swing or to think about the, the, the way that the rhythms overlap in those traditions. Oh yeah, that sounds great. So, um, as we were talking about earlier, your, your newest project is um, uh, The Death of uh, Stalin, uh, which from the trailer uh, looks uh, very entertaining to me. And um, how was your working process on that and what exactly was uh, your approach when it came to scoring that movie? My early conversations with Armando Iannucci, who's the director of the film, uh, we actually weren't sure if it was going to have lots of score or if it would actually use lots of uh, Soviet music from the 50s. That, that, that was what he was uh, toying with in the, in the temp, um, especially Shostakovich, but also uh, Weinberg uh, and uh, some more recent um, composers as a wonderful modernist called uh, Galina Ostvolskaya that he was uh, using in the temp track. Um, but um, the alternative, of course, would be for me to just disappear into a cave for <laughs> six months <laughs> and try to learn how to write like those people. Uh, and the advantage of that, of course, is that is that we wouldn't be constrained by the limitations of, of, of whatever material we could find um, from those composers. And we went that way. And, of course, there's so much you can do to shape a film score that you can't do if, if, you're, if you're borrowing bits. In fact, classical music really doesn't make it into film scores very often because it simply doesn't, it doesn't flow in the way that you might need to. It just doesn't, uh, it doesn't lie flat very often. Um, the emotions in it are just so often aren't, aren't exactly right or they change too quickly. Uh, so I, I just I studied lots and lots of uh, Shostakovich and Weinberg and Prokofiev uh, I was listening to, uh, to to quite a few different Soviets, and it was it was a while before I actually wrote anything that I, that I left in the film, because I really just wanted to try to um, to be able to write in that sort of way uh, without without that being all I was thinking about, because I you know needed to be thinking about the film itself and the story. Um, we we came up with the idea of a of a, a, a certain nervousness, a certain nervous pulse that would run through the film. The film is all these uh, politicians jockeying for power um, with the knowledge that the one who ended up on top might might well kill all the others. Uh, so so the, there's quite high stakes in the film. I think that uh, that the stylistically there's something quite useful about about that, that sort of method acting in a, in a comedy of of just just situating yourself in in a style in the past. Um, Uh, the one that would spin in my mind, and then, there may be others, I'm not sure what you would say about this, but um, Young Frankenstein, I think, is absolutely glorious. Oh, yeah. It has, this, it has this score that just completely inhabits the past, uh, and it's able to uh, be sympathetic to the needs of the film. Uh, it's able to play all of the emotions, but because it's, because it's, it's, it's old-fashioned, the whole thing is, is, uh, is amusing. Yeah, it's, uh, it's very believable. Um, uh, and although Stalin is not a spoof, I think there's something similar about the score there. I just, just completely and utterly commit to imagining that this is a, this is a Soviet film in the 50s and I'm, I'm Shostakovich who's been employed to score it. Um, <laughs> somehow, somehow there's something slightly funny and, and, uh, and something that allows you to laugh about how extreme and how unlike a, a film in 2017, 2018, that ends up sounding. 
Oh yeah, um, I think it was Elmer Bernstein who said that um, a comedy score should uh, play it completely straight. Um, and, and you can see it uh, in his work for stuff like um, uh, Airplane and, uh, and movies like that. And for the most part that approach really works. And when I, uh, when I listened to The Death of Stalin, I was like, this, this sounds very serious and very epic. And when I played it to my, uh, to my parents, uh, who, are, um, who know a lot about classical music, uh, they were like, wow, the, they, they were also just like me, was like, this is a pretty um, great homage to, to that, that kind of uh, Soviet music, which I always um, uh, had a soft spot for. Ghostbusters is rather like that too, isn't it? Yes. Ghostbusters is, is absolutely huge. Um, another guy I didn't thought during Stalin was that the comedy itself didn't really need my help. A lot of the comedy actually in the film stays stays very dry. Um, and, and a lot of the comedy is indoors. We're really seeing these, these men arguing with each other. And the tragedy is outdoors. The tragedy is every time they make a stupid decision. <laughs> uh, it, I mean, it's life or death for many people outside, and in a way that that's where the music is is chiming in is is uh, is in the sort of the, the the Russian tragedy that's that's taking place outside. Yes, there'll be nothing worse than trying to do that and not not really succeeding. So I just had to. Uh, of course, as I said, I have, I have an academic background, so I was able to to. Uh, uh, my, my my PhD was was uh, was music analysis, really. So so. I'm not sure I would say I um, was. I wasn't writing essays about Shostakovich symphonies, but but I was just looking as as deeply as I could uh, into those composers and trying to understand that um, that language they have. You know, how how do we get how do we get from one key to another? Um, how how is the orchestra used? How much does this instrument get used? And uh, how much does that? chord get used and of course it's, it's a very evolved language so it was very helpful actually uh, I'm a huge fan of, of John Williams and Who I've been isn't? noticing <laughs> since I spent all that time obsessively thinking about the Soviets uh, I hear a lot uh, I hear a lot in, in John Williams that I didn't hear before in the way that he um, can stay ambiguous about which key he's in for a long time uh, whereas a sort of standard film music aesthetic is that you, you jump <laughs> you jump up a minor third every uh, every ten bars or so. Uh, Williams, like Shostakovich, is able to 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 not reveal his his hand for long periods of time. You can't really you can't really decide. Uh, am I in E minor or E flat major? I can't really tell. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, that was getting that was getting very nerdy. Oh no no no! <laughs> that's that, that's all this podcast is about. Actually, I have a lot of <laughs> I had a lot of uh, great great film fans and and nerds and just people who know a lot about the stuff um, as guests. So um, it's 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 perfect. It's interesting to think to rethink orchestration with those uh, with those people in mind too. Uh, like Shostakovich and Weinberg will use the, the xylophone a lot, and they don't seem to think, when they use the xylophone, that that it means uh, Gershwin or circus or fun. Yeah. In the way that in the way that uh, so often in the West we do, they just use it as a as a percussive extra element. It just sort of turns up, um, and so it's one of those instruments where if you just if you just use it with that belief, then that's kind of how it sounds. Uh, like the saxophone, in a way, you just it, it, you know it, it can exist completely outside of of jazz or outside of the associations that that um, that you normally attach to it. Um, but anyway, it was enormously uh, educational to to go through that process. I, I can imagine it's it's it, it sounds like a lot of work, but also like um, a, a lot of fun. Um, what do you think about, uh, may maybe you have some thoughts on this, the current state of, um, uh, of film music, like uh, in the way that uh, there are 
fan reactions and how popular it is and actually how much criticism it uh, nowadays gets, especially in a lot of those uh, franchise uh, things where some critics say it just sounds all the same and too anonymous. Right, right. Well, I think it would probably, it would be wrong to be straightforwardly, simplistically nostalgic uh, because it is, it, uh, the, the, the music is responding to the, to the needs of the films and, uh, and, and the fact that it is changing in any way is, is interesting. You know, the, 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 the style of film music is, is constantly changing. Um, probably the better, better that, it, that it should change uh, than that it should stay completely the same. Um, I, do think that, I do think that there are various virtues of the way film music was uh, a generation or two ago. And there are certain difficulties with um, uh, with with current with the style of current film music. Um, yeah, in some cases, uh, I think that um, it's just simply hard to get away from the fact that if you want film music to sound more like uh, electronic music or or pop music, then you're going to be inclined towards having the same meter. Whereas if you're in a an idiom uh, that's sort of borrowing from Stravinsky and uh, and the late Romantics and and Holst and so forth, then then the meter can change all the time, and it doesn't it doesn't stick out as being odd. So old film music actually had certain advantages as far as getting around the um, action goes, and I think it's telling that animation music is still like that because animation relies so much on it, it, it makes such heavy demands on the composer. To, um, to fit in with it in terms of timing. Um, and I also think we're discovering that, that beds, beds of, of, of rhythm and pulsation are, are quite problematic, uh, you know, which you often have in modern film music, are quite problematic in the, final, in the final mix. A lot of it disappears against sound effects. Uh, yeah. There's something about organic sounds um, Trumpets, violins, woodwind flourishes, which is that very quickly they can they can be quite bright without being annoying because they're organic, and very quickly they can give you a lot of information. So they can poke out of all the explosions and the yelling and the and the lasers going off, and and tell you something about the film very quickly. Um, uh, we don't have uh, we don't have great ways uh, in in more modern idioms. For something to sort of jump out of the texture like that and, and give you lots of information. Um, uh, in fact, there's, of course, there's a danger if you did that in a synthetic way. It might just sound like a sound effect. It might just sound like a, a an, an electronic door opening on, in the scene uh, or something. Uh, so I think there 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 are certain virtues that film music had um, a while ago that are just unavoidable. But I don't think it's. I don't think. That it is that, it, that the way that the sort of modern that the the, the, the desire for, for modern sounds uh, is irreconcilable with with those older virtues. Um, I just think it's very tricky, uh, and we're sort of seeing that playing out right now. If there isn't room in a big mainstream film to to experiment and to take risks, then you do indeed get kind of the same thing a lot, as you were saying. Yeah, yeah. You have you 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 have to have. Um, a lot of reputation and uh, an own recognizable voice to be able to to experiment. That's that's why uh, certain composers who are big names uh, do it all the time, and uh, for the most part, it pays off. But I'm always glad when I uh, listen to a modern score, where I can tell that. Um, it was influenced and inspired by something that was more classical than like a modern blockbuster score from two or three years ago. One of the most pleasant surprises was um, um, a 2016 score for a video game called The Dwarves and it was composed by um, uh, Benny Oshman and uh, his score sounded like it was inspired by the old school fantasy scores by uh, Jerry Goldsmith and uh, Basil Polidorus and I was like this is actually very refreshing to hear
check that out. Oh yeah, it's a great score. It's, it's very old-fashioned and uh, the same uh, feelings I had when I when I listened to uh, the death of Stalin because like I said I always like this uh, kind of uh, classical music and to hear the, just this 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 very very big and uh, uh, very fitting homage to to classic stuff like that um, I, I I found uh, very inspiring and I immediately just you know like you as you know I I put it uh, uh, on Twitter and said you should totally listen to this this is this is some great stuff Yeah. Um, uh, what um, can you maybe name some of your uh, favorite uh, scores you ever um, listened to? Oh, sure thing. I'm a big fan of Morricone. Um, oh yeah. I love the the, the big uh, the big spaghetti western scores. I think they're just so so creative and and bold, and there's that sort of sort of wild macho, but but not boring. Uh, fun, colorful thing that he was able to do uh, with them. Um, I'm very fond of the uh, various early uh, Disney scores. I love the score to to Snow White, for instance. Oh yeah, that's uh, it's just glorious. And the Wizard of Oz is glorious too. I think as film composers, we should remember how m how much musicals, um, uh, how important musicals were. Early on in in, uh, uh, in films, um, it's interesting actually. You know that the standard way that one talks about a film score is to think of themes attaching themselves to characters, but of course in a in a musical the themes are attached to songs. So the themes are attached to ideas about the film, or you know themes uh, in the sense of abstract. Uh, abstract themes, which I think is um, it's just a refreshing like flip to do sometimes on film. Do, do we have to have a theme for this person, and do we have to have a theme for that person? What if this were a musical? If this were a musical, then we'd use, we'd use a song that one of them sang, but it wouldn't necessarily then mean that that was about that person all the time. Um, uh, so I go back to those a lot. Um, I adore the score to Psycho. I think it's absolutely... Uh, Fantastic! What would I give to, 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 to watch Psycho with the sound effects and, and dialogue intact, but with the music taken away? That would be just amazing, I think. Oh yeah, uh, especially. <laughs> it would be the weirdest experience. Yeah, especially considering that Hitchcock uh, in the in the shower scene didn't want any score, and then Bernard Herrmann convinced him by playing the piece, and Hitchcock was like, "Oh, okay, I uh, I agree with you." <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
course, those are all rather rather old examples. Um, uh, uh, I admire many scores that I hear um, that, are, that are more current, but um, you tend to sort of uh, gravitate towards things that um, things that you grew up with, uh, don't you? Things that you were exposed to early. So I I, I often go back to uh, to those things for just for a little uh, a little pick me up. Oh yeah, um, one of my earliest experiences with uh, film music where I was like, wow, film music is great and which made me a fan uh, uh, were actually a couple of Harry Jackson Williams scores, stuff like Chicken Run and uh, Sinbad. Um, th those I really... The, uh, yes, I, I got the CD to Chicken Run uh, uh, many years ago and was, and was um, yeah, hugely inspired by it. Yeah, it, uh, it's a great score, um, and it's uh, it, that was one of the first scores that really stuck with me alongside with uh, Danny Elfman's Nightmare Before Christmas and the first uh, John Williams' Harry Potter. So I I, um, I just uh, grew up with the right stuff at the right time and uh, uh, slowly um, kind of developed um, a, an ear for, uh, for the styles of the composer. So when One Piece would play on the radio, I never heard... I immediately recognized the composer, and I was like, "Wow, I can I can recognize this. This is this is kind of weird." Oh, that's great! Yes, um, I've been making some fun discoveries about uh, about Williams. Um, maybe most people know this already, but uh, but through Mickey Mouse, I've been sort of exploring a lot of this uh, what we call yesteryear music. Um, things from the middle of the century, from, from say the late 50s until maybe the early 80s. Uh, lots of TV commercials and TV shows and arrangements too, you know, um, um, uh, Esquivel or um, Percy Faith and his orchestra, those kinds of, uh, those kinds of musicians who are all generally extraordinarily good. There's, a, there's, a, there's, there's a, such a high level of craftsmanship um, that was just around in in in, um, in mainstream music, uh, in, in mainstream sort of uh, pop culture. Um, but uh, along the way, I sort of ended up discovering the the kind of pre pre Jaws, pre Star Wars, John Williams, which is always so exciting. Um, things like Lost in Space or The Towering Inferno, which which sounds very Williams. As we know him, but also has bass guitar and drum kit, and sort of um, mysterious vibraphone chords. Uh, so much more, uh, many more elements that you associate with that, with those, with those years, but not necessarily with him. The sort of things that you'd expect to hear in a Lalo Schifrin score or something. Ah, uh -huh, um, all right. I think that's great. It's just like. It's like uh, seeing old photos of a of a of an old friend from a time when you didn't know him or something, um, and he he handles all that stuff very well. He's, he he wrote very well for those jazzier or, or even kind of more funky elements. Oh yeah, uh, he started uh, like as as a, as a jazz pianist uh, when I, when I remembered correctly, right? I think that's right. Yes, yes. I have um, two more questions for you, and uh, one of them would be. Um, what are some of your favorite movies? I've been thinking about this watching watching screeners recently. I don't think I'd make a very good movie reviewer. Uh, my 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 feelings about a brand new film are always so incoherent and vague. And I think you, you, your favorite movies tend to remain the same uh, through your life, don't don't they? And I think it's it's quite nice ultimately to sort of embrace that. Um, I absolutely adore. Uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail, which I just rewatched. Um, I would have been embarrassed to, to say that until rewatching it, but it's just such a good film. My goodness, and the music is absolutely terrific too. It's nearly all um, library music, but it works so unbelievably well. Yeah, it sounds um, very authentic, as well as the whole movie pretty much looks authentic, which is kind of surprising. Yes, the movie the movie looks much better than it really has any right to. That's one of the one of the delights of, of rewatching it, is you can see the talents of, of Terry Jones and Terry Gilliam in in actually making a, a, a really good movie on with no money at all. Yeah, as the, the scene as the as the army as Arthur mysteriously conjures that enormous army at the end, um, 
and they clearly didn't have that many people if you really look totally dispassionately at, at, <laughs> at every shot. But, um, but the photography is absolutely terrific. So yeah, that's a movie that I grew up with that I, that I just, I, I, I know, know I'll never get away from. Um, uh, and the original Star Wars trilogy is like that for me too. All three of them equally, I, I think, uh, really in my brain. I know one's supposed to say that Empire is one's favorite, and of course it, it does seem to be the best made, but, um, but uh, all three of those. I'm extremely fond of, of, of Hitchcock as well. Uh, but really, yeah, to be, to be brutally honest, that's a, that's a slightly later thing. Um, it's hard. I, I do think it's hard to get away from the films that you, that you really loved. Uh, when you were very, very young. Uh, certainly, certainly Disney movies as well. Um, Mary Poppins and Dumbo. Um, uh, Dumbo, I think, is just unbelievably well-made film. And it's not too long. It's, uh, it's very, very unlike a modern film in that it, it gets, to, uh, gets to an interesting place and then just ends um, very, very elegantly. Yeah, I, would, I think that was one of those movies where Disney didn't have a, a lot of money because I think that it came out around the time that uh, Fantasia wasn't the big hit they expected it to be and so right, they right. didn't have uh, that big budget for, for Dumbo but I think uh, the limitations really helped this uh, small story to evolve. Right, yes. Yes, if it, were a, if it were a modern film he'd discover he could fly and then there'd be an evil elephant who could also fly, <laughs> who was trying to blow up New York with a nuclear bomb. Oh, man. And so Dumbo would have to have an aerial battle with the evil... You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> would, the whole film would be half an hour longer or 45 minutes longer. Yeah, who knows uh, how, the, how the remake that's currently in the works uh, will be, you know? Oh, uh, right, of course. Yes, yes. As, as far as I know, the story will be drastically different, but I, but I doubt that it will... Uh, go in, in the direction you just mentioned as, as, as <laughs> interesting as that might be <laughs> uh, what about you what, what are your favorite movies oh i'm um i'm a lot of rings freak pretty much like oh. the the Lord of rings trilogy uh, to me is is one of the uh, best things ever put uh, on a screen and i only accept the extended edition and uh, my favorite of those uh, i think it's fellowship because that's just all around one of the most perfect movies ever. I'm also a big fan of Edgar Wright and his projects, especially like the Cornetto trilogy. Um, right. And I also really love the first Ghostbusters and the first Men in Black. Um, but then later down the road, you know, you come, uh, when, when I would make a list, you would come across movies like Wally -E and Up and um, certain animated stuff like how to train your dragon of course like i'm i'm a big uh, animation uh, fan and um, right me too those those movies are um have have this uh, certain touch of magic especially the things made by pixar so um yeah those are some of my favorites i agree with all of those um yes anyway, but um it's interesting the way one yeah the the thing the things that are particularly formative um stay with you even though even though other so I, I I was just that bit older when when uh, Lord of the Rings happened um, so it hasn't sort of entered my bloodstream in quite the way that uh, you know that Star Wars or that uh, or that Holy Grail did um, but yes aren't they aren't they glorious yeah uh, the Lord of the Rings movies were pretty much my Star Wars because obviously I <laughs> I am too young for growing up with the original trilogy, so um, when Lord of the Rings uh, entered uh, the picture, I already knew the story, and uh, from from a big, big um, uh, like uh, aud uh, audio play I had, but I, did, I hadn't read uh, the books at that point. And after I watched the movies, I um, I read the books by myself and. And then saw like, all right, they change this and that, and there's a lot more to this. But it's uh, it's one of the best, um, it, yeah, it, it's one of the best uh, film trilogies ever made, in my opinion. Even though you know Star Wars, of course, um, uh, those movies are also great. And it's 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 really weird to see uh, that saga continuing. You know that actually now a new generation uh, has a new uh, series of Star Wars movies. That's something quite amazing. Yeah, that's right. And uh, I, I remember when I started to um, interview, uh, I, I was working at um, 
at Clare College in Cambridge and started getting involved in the undergrad interviews. So I was meeting very promising musicians who were 10 years younger than me. Uh, uh, it was it was astonishing to realize that, uh, that Lord of the Rings, and possibly even by that time Harry Potter, I think especially Lord of the Rings, was becoming a major sort of pop culture reference point for people who are a bit younger than me because they yeah it, it had hit them at exactly that right moment uh, and musically too a lot of uh, people who were then 18 when I was in my late 20s were were, were talking about these things that, that that I had admired a lot but that sort of um, uh, uh, come and gone whereas clearly it was worth remembering that if you were that bit younger they absolutely kind of uh, hit you between the eyes. It's fun, to, to go back to the uh, the Disney Junior show, the, the Lion Guard, it's always fun to, to see that with with little kids and be reminded of how intensely a younger person is invested in, in the story. We were actually doing a mix a few weeks ago, finishing an episode, and there was a tour happening around Disney. Uh, uh, and some, some little kids, I think they were about seven, came in and saw the start of our mix. Uh, and we said, okay, well, we'll... We'll, we'll just play you the first five minutes. I mean, we have we have work to do, but we'll, <laughs> we'll start the episode. And we started it, and then we stopped it. And they were like, oh, what are you doing? <laughs> we're like, I'm sorry, we, we have to actually make this. <laughs> we can't just play it to you. Um, and it's so delightful to be reminded that um, uh, that, that, that people get, get so uh, so enthused about the things that we make. Yeah, yeah, that's just amazing. Um, and my final question for you would be, um, what kind of uh, movie, like uh, what what type of genre would be like your dream project for the future? Oh, um, uh, well, I'd love to do more uh, animation. I think that's a wonderful uh, uh, area. So, uh, so I'm hopeful about about that. I'm very interested to see where. Uh, Armando Iannucci goes next. Uh, I'm sure he'll be in live action, but um, uh, but it's it's been wonderful working working with him, uh, working with someone so uh, music sympathetic musically, He's very knowledgeable about music. Yes, I'm very very uh, invested in, in 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 mainstream movies, especially more fantastical ones, uh, family adventures and and animations. Would be wonderful to uh, to be to be in that in that world um, moving forward. Oh yeah, um, uh, uh, animation uh, stuff is always the most thing, uh, and especially like family fantasy things, almost always the most uh, thankful projects uh, in terms of music. Yes, and, and sort of crafting a view of the world that you would like to pass on. You know, <laughs> if that doesn't sound too pretentious. Um, ma making something that you know young people will, will get will get abs will fall absolutely in love with that would be great oh yeah uh, that would be indeed fantastic so um before we um end this uh, is there anything uh, maybe you want to ask or uh, you know, a specific question you have or another thing you want to talk about i was going to mention that maybe maybe you maybe maybe you put this on twitter already uh but i was very pleased to see the death of stalin soundtrack appear on spotify um, so if anyone is interested in what we were talking about, they can easily uh, go and listen to it there. In the UK, it's coming out in all of the usual ways, uh, CD. It's also coming out on vinyl, rather amazingly. Oh, yeah, but, um, but it's kind of fitting, actually. Um, uh, I hope that that happens here, too, although I'm not certain. But you were asking me if I had any questions for you. Um, uh, who's, what's been your most... Uh, most exciting uh, interview to have oh um well um uh, this would be one of them and i also a, a few months back did an interview with um, that was my first interview with a um a professional uh, from the movie world and my first interview was with a um, great composer douglas pipes um which right. uh, where we talked a lot about um his work on stuff like monster house and especially krampus that was the a score where I discovered him pretty much uh, for myself, and yeah, we we had a great chat um, uh, about uh, certain things, um, like his inspiration, also 
some projects he would like to do and uh, some things he was currently working on and I, w I was very excited and, and very nervous uh, about it and it and it turned out very well um, I, I got I got some very good feedback for it and I hope I, I for the future uh, I can also get some some people from uh, the film music world or maybe like uh, some people who work in um, in, in other um, professions. Uh, if you really want to hear amazing composer interviews, go to sideshowsoundtheater.com where um, Ian Grab, um, he has an interview section where, there and he already interviewed some amazing composers like uh, Elon Ashkery and also uh, Bruce Broughton. Um, he's an amazing guy, he's a very good friend of mine and uh, his interviews are very informative and very very fun. I, I just, I highly recommend checking those out. Uh, oh, that's super. Uh, I'm a big fan of, of Bruce Broughton. You know each other a little bit, and uh, I really think he's a wonderful composer. Oh, he is. Uh, uh, and and his, his wife is, is uh, Belinda Broughton, who is an absolutely incredible violinist. Um, uh, she's one of, the, one of the first call violins in, in L.A., so you'll have heard her playing endlessly on uh, uh, in your CD collection. <laughs> that's that's great. So, um, be before we um, say our little goodbyes, where can people find you and your work online? Uh, well, I have a Twitter feed, at Mr. Chris Willis, which I do update, uh, unless I'm absolutely uh, drowning under a, a flood of, <laughs> of notes. Uh, I wish I, I wish I kept it more up to date, um, but um, yes, uh, I'm just scribbling away too fast most of the time. Uh, and I have a website, ChristopherWillisComposer.com, where you can find lots of links to things that I've done. Uh, and there's a news section about what I'm going to be doing uh, in the future. So that's those are the two uh, the two best places to keep up with me. Oh, that, that's great. Um, let me just say um, that I had a tremendous amount of fun uh, chatting with you. Thank you so much for your time and uh, special special thanks uh, to your wife. Without her, I wouldn't have been able to uh, to, to arrange this because I, 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 I couldn't uh, quite reach you on uh, on Twitter, but luckily um, I could her. And so she um, she's she was actually the driving force um, behind... Um, uh, f finding this meeting and um, I'm very very thankful so um, s say her again a, a big thank you from me oh I certainly will and um, you know she's a she's a much bigger star than me uh, do you do you know I don't know if you've seen on Twitter uh, she uh, she plays an opera singing alien in the last Jedi uh, oh that's amazing yeah. Uh, if you've seen the film, you know in the middle when the uh, she, so she's a session singer. She she's uh, a, a, a great LA session singer. Um, uh, but, uh, among the more bizarre of her recent gigs was to uh, was to sing one one high B operatically for uh, uh, for the last Jedi. So yes, we're the, the, in the in the casino scene in the middle of the stampede, we see uh, this bizarre alien lady. Uh, singing just as uh, she's singing a high note just before she gets run over by all these uh, all sort of wildebeest. Creatures. Oh yeah, I remember that. I didn't know that at all. That's awesome. <laughs> I'm I'm hoping to get myself a T-shirt in the Star Wars font that says "Husband of the Slug Lady" <laughs> or something. Um, uh, anyway, yes, yes. Um, uh, uh, thanks to her and to you for for working this out. Oh, that's uh, that's great. Uh, thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, it yeah, it, it it has been um, a lot of fun, and um, uh, and I hope um, I I can uh, continue this, uh, getting just uh, very creative uh, people from all over the world um, who work in the movie business, and um, I I wish you all the best for your um, future projects. I I will I will of course um, uh, stay up to date. And um, uh, let, let me just say, um, your score for The Death of Stalin, it's in my uh, top uh, 15 of uh, best scores of 2017. Oh, that's great. Oh, thank you so much. <laughs> the, the list will go online um, in a few days, like at the end of the month. I'm currently still working on it and listen to some stuff. 
But um, as soon as I uh, heard like the first track of it, I was like, this, this is going up there. There's, there's no chance it won't. <laughs> I'm glad if it gives you uh, hope that there are still old school composers around, then I'm very happy. <laughs> yeah, it it it, to it totally does. It it reinforced my, uh, uh, it really re reinforced my hope that oh oh great, uh, people actually uh, draw some inspiration of some stuff that isn't like from the last three years. <laughs> <laughs> yes, very much so. That, that's always fun. So, um, dear listeners, you can find me and my stuff, of course, on Facebook and on Twitter, at Lasse Vogt. Um, uh, you can find all my stuff, uh, as well as this podcast, on YouTube. Um, that Deppert is the channel name, or if you just type in Lasse Vogt or Fans About Films. And I write um, German soundtrack reviews for uh, scoregeek.wordpress.com. Thank you so much uh, for your time. Uh, thank you, Lasse. Great talking to you. Goodbye. Thank you. Goodbye, dear listeners, and good night.